thank you all for joining us, and um, you may be seated. Well, thank you. We have folks today from 55 states, Canadian provinces, and foreign countries. I welcome you all. And uh, for those of you in warmer climates, we had to put blankets on our flowers last night. I know that's weird. I know you, you folks don't get that, but you're in the land of the frozen chosen now, so this, this, is, what we, this is what we deal with. Now, I want a, a pastor. I want America's pastor. He, he's one of my favorite, and he's, I consider him my pastor, Jack Hibbs, to come out and open, open this day in prayer with an invocation. Um, Jack, as you know, Pastor Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California, and you know, he was in his hotel Thursday night, and folks came up to him and said, you're our pastor, because we don't have a church. So, Jack, come on out, let's open in prayer, and then you take it away. Love you. Can I, uh, can I have you stand as we... I know, but we need the exercise, right? <laughs> We're going to pray and get this conference started by inviting him, right? And let's do this like we do this at home. I don't know why. It doesn't make any difference, but it's fun. Can you just, just raise your hands up? That is an awesome sight. Father, we come before you this day, and Lord, we first of all want to thank you for the God that you are. Lord, that in this world you have given us not only hope, you've given us the blessed hope. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless everything, that you would coordinate, and God, that you would organize everything about this conference and to think about the scope and the reach that this great conference has. So, Lord, protect the technology of it all. And, Lord, those that are viewing around the world, that you would... Hold back the prince of the air, the wicked one that would seek to disrupt. We pray for this auditorium that there would be no disruption. And God, that you'd put the fear of who you are in this place. For those of us who know you, that is a beautiful reverence. That's a wonderful thing. For those who do not know you, Lord, may it be a terror that leads them to salvation today. By the end of the day. God, we pray that you would bless J.D. as he reels in with his message, not only encouragement to our souls, but salvation to the lost. And Father, we pray that you'd bless Amir and Billy and Eric and Father Jan. Jan, Lord, we lift up to you. We pray, God, we would not be here today without Jan's steadfast faithfulness and Lord, she is a Deborah to our nation and to the church. And so, Father, we ask now in Jesus' name that you would bless. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. God bless you guys. And on, listen, on behalf of all of the speakers, we have to tell you right now today that we are so grateful for you. We had a chance to meet some of you in the last uh, 24 hours, but to meet uh, a young lady from Switzerland who made her way here. Yeah. And uh, exactly. But many of you, we were looking at the uh, parking lot as we were pulling in and out and license plates from all over the United States. And it's just amazing. There's even some crazy people from Chino Hills, Southern California over here. For the, <laughs> for the life of me. I don't, I don't understand that, but um, I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 3 this morning, Revelation chapter 3, and I've been asked to kick things off, and you're going to be hearing a lot of the update and current event issues and challenges from our following speakers today, but I've been asked to set the tone, and I'm grateful uh, by Jan and for Jan for this, but I've been asked to give a message to you today regarding God's prophetic pulpit in the last days. God's prophetic pulpit in the last days. Personally, I don't believe there's any other kind of pulpit than that kind of pulpit in these last days. Revelation chapter 3, 
I'll read, you can follow along, verse 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. You have kept my word, you have not denied my name, and indeed I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I tell you, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to persevere, and that's exactly what I think regarding all of you here this morning, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on it. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God. And I will write on him my new name, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The last seven words of Jesus Christ and the last seven statements of the Lord Jesus Christ was to a gathering of churches that throughout all of the ages would represent the church. In the last 2,000 years, when Jesus acknowledged those seven churches of Asia Minor, he was not only speaking to an actual, factual group of people, real churches, but we know from the study of these last 2,000 years that there is a typology to that message that Jesus gave that addresses, listen, not only the believers of any given time, but the chronology of the church in the last days. Now, many of you have articulated to us as the speakers that you go to churches that don't teach the word or you've given up on attending a church that no longer is adherent to the word of God. And for that, we are very sorry. It shocks many of us. Uh, I happen to live in Southern California where it is crazy to be in California. But you know what? I wouldn't live in any other place on the earth for this one reason. Thank God, in California, the gray has evaporated. You are either following Jesus Christ in California or you are not following Jesus Christ in California. And I'm grateful for that line that has been drawn in the sand. We are living in amazing days. But remember this, that in those seven letters to the seven churches, Jesus opened it up and he announced and he said to the angel that is in that city, whether it be Ephesus or Philadelphia, Jesus is speaking to the Anglios. And it's very simple to understand that it's not an angel with wings that somehow resides over that church or that city in a spiritual sense. It is actually the pastor of those churches, each of them, that gave the word of God and was to be giving the word of God to the people. And so Jesus addresses them. And I don't know if you're a pastor in the house, if you're a pastor watching this morning, that is a very sobering thought that God would address pastors in such a way that he goes up one side of them and down the other. And it's, it's typified and it's lived out. The reality is tested that the pastor's ministry is seen in the conduct and the faithfulness or not of the church that they preside over. And to me, that's a very sobering thing. And so we're going to look at seven things this morning that I want you to be thinking about as you enter into these last days. And I want to set up by this challenge this morning for all the rest of the speakers, because I want you to go home and I want you to take a fire back home. I believe it's a fire, by the way, that brought you here, but I want to have you go back with even a greater intensity, because it just might be that your word to your pastor or your church leaders can change things around. Church family, this morning I'm telling you, I'm giving you a report now from California. We have never seen it like this since the last 40 years 
But a revival is about to break out in California. The churches are waking up. Pastors are addressing the issues. Prayer meetings are breaking out. Something's happening in California. And thank God, as the nation knows, whatever happens in California never stays in California. It infiltrates the rest of the nation. But God, God is about to move, and he's moving. I was gathered at a prayer meeting just uh, two weeks ago and uh, in a, a wonderful community, and I had the opportunity uh, at that home where this prayer meeting had gathered and pastors were there, and I think there, I don't remember how many people were there, but it was more than enough, and we prayed for revival, and I sensed the Spirit of God moving. And then on the very next day, I gathered together in Santa Barbara, and pastors began to gather, and God filled up that church because people are waking up and I got to tell you, it was awesome to be praying at that house and to be looking to the neighbor next door of Oprah Winfrey was next door. That was her house. And then to the left of us was uh, Ellen's house. And we were praying and that home prays for the salvation of that neighborhood. Something's happening. We've got a governor running or we have a man running for governor in California that's a born-again believer, came to Christ on October 31st, 1979, and he's running on a pro-life platform. And seven weeks ago, he was 27 points down, and last week, he's six points down. God is doing a work in California. Why? What's happening? What's happening is that the pulpits are waking up. That's what's happening. Number one, church, write it down if you're taking notes. God's prophetic pulpit in these last days are going to have to have certain requirements. And this is a standard by which I think you ought to judge the church that you attend or that you're looking for. And that is it has to be, it's going to have to be an authentic pulpit. It's got to be an authentic pulpit that God is able to use. In these last days, I want to be very careful to announce that the greatest eschatological prophecy doctrine that graces the chapters of the Bible is the doctrine of salvation. Never forget it. God's first prophetic announcement was that he would save mankind from their sins. God spoke that in Genesis chapter 3. We need to remember that. So the number one overriding doctrine of the Bible regarding the last days is an authentic pulpit committed to the fact that Jesus Christ alone saves, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him that we preach it without apology. The pulpit needs to be authentic. The pulpit needs to be giving out the word of God. When we talk about what is gonna bring back America, it goes back to how America was born. The pulpits were ablaze in the colonies. I hope you've taken the time, if not, please do. Read about the black robe regiment of the colonial pastors of America. Is there hope for America? There must be hope for America. Because, because when there was no hope, God brought the preaching of the gospel and built upon that is the liberty that's found in Christ. And our founding fathers viewed the fact that what they heard and saw by the pastors in the pulpit, it was authentic. And that fire started in the heart of a man by the name of Samuel Adams, not the beer maker, the liberty maker. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin wrote that there had never been a revolution without the understanding of Samuel Adams of liberty. And then they turned, as it were, the microphone, and you can read all about it in his own writings. Where did you get the understanding of liberty? Samuel Adams said, from the pulpits of America. Christ sets us free, he said. And the pulpits of America today need to be authentic. Stop playing games, getting back to the preaching of the gospel. And the gospel, the very first word, church, you ought to know this, the very first word of the gospel, do you know what it is? There's no salvation without that first word. There's no gospel without that first word. That word is repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Metanoia, change your mind. That's what it means. Change the way you think about Jesus Christ. Pulpits today need to be authentic. A.W. Tozer wrote this. There is today no lack of Bible teachers to set forth correctly the principles of the doctrines of Christ, but to many of these seem satisfied to teach fundamentals of the faith year after year. 
strangely unaware that there is in their uh, ministry no manifest presence, nor anything unusual in their personal lives. They minister constantly to believers who feel within their breast a longing which their teaching simply does not satisfy. Milton's terrible sentence applies to our day as accurately as it did to his. Quote, the hungry sheep look up and are not fed. Close quote. Tozer went on to say, it is a solemn thing and no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while they are actually seated at the Father's table. What a prophetic quote that was by Tozer. You can be in church and be dying, starving. And the Bible says that my, per my people perish for a lack of vision. The pulpit must be authentic. The pulpit, listen, cannot be authentic. If the pulpit is preoccupied with the pastor seeking popularity, seeking some sort of exposure to the point where, look at me. Listen, the pastor, the ministry cannot be judged by the pastor's charisma. What is coming out of the pulpit? Is it authentic? Is it true? Is it honoring to Christ? And is it faithful to the challenge that Jesus gave? You've kept my word and you've not denied my name. If we stand true as Christians in these last days, persecution must come. Make no mistake about it. Young people today, I'm going to tell you the truth right out of the gate. You want to know how real this gospel is? It's so real that everything regarding the word of God is so true that Jesus said, cheer up when the world hates you because the world hated him first. You see, pastor, I don't want to be hated by anybody. That's not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. You stand with Jesus. You stand for Jesus. You be true to the word. And if you're a pastor, a Christian worker, be authentic to the gospel of God. And you reconcile this. The most loving individual that has ever been in the history of man is Jesus Christ. And at this hour, the most hated individual around the world at this moment is none other than Jesus Christ. It's his name and his name alone that's a cut word all around the world. You can be in China, you can be in Israel, you can be in South Africa, and you may not understand the language, but somebody will drop Jesus Christ into that argument and you'll know they're cussing. Nobody says that about Muhammad. Nobody picks up a hammer and smashes their finger and yells out Buddha. <laughs> Jesus is praised and worshipped by us and he's hated by the world. And the pulpit needs a place, needs to be a place where it's authentic and true to the word of God. And this is the mandate for us as believers, small group leaders, pastors, in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible there says, I will give you shepherds according to my heart, God says, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Does your church feed you with knowledge and understanding that is applicable that you might go out and live an authentic Christianity? Listen, this is a sobering statement. The church you attend, you will become like the shepherd. Sheep will become like the shepherd. And today across America, there's a drought for authentic believers. And I fight, thank God for all of you. We're in, a, we're in a house of friends here today that love the word. It's a joy to come here. It's a joy to be with you. John chapter 21, verse 17, the Bible says, Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Notice what Jesus' test is to Peter. And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. And Jesus turned to him and said, feed my sheep. The church is to be the most, I, listen, the church ought to be the most dynamic, powerful, influential presence in your community. Your church that you attend. The community should, in a sense, be drawn to the church that you attend or be terrified of it, and I mean that in a good way. They'll know that we can't get this sex education into our school district with that, with that church, with its finger on the pulse of our community. We can't build that bar, that strip club down the street, because that church is going to let people know about it. 
Think of it. In early America, many of you come from the East Coast. You know those old cities and towns. They're not laid out in wonderful, perfect grids like we have out West that's somewhat newer. The old cities back East, they're crazy. The roads are crazy because they all lead to one certain point in the, in the town. Have you noticed? I don't care if it's Philadelphia or Boston. And what is in the middle of where all those roads bring you to a culminating point, like the, the wheel or the axle on the, on the wheel? What, what's at the point of it? A church. That's how America began. The pulpits were authentic and the preachers preached the word of God and they were careless about what people thought about them. They understood that the answer to God. The second thing I want to bring to your attention today is that God's prophetic pulpit in these last days will have to be a pulpit that is engaging. It's an engaged pulpit. What do we mean by that? That it is a pulpit that is not only giving out the word of God. You know, when I said a moment ago, I'm among friends with you going back home. There is a great work going on in California, but our battle today is trying to get pulpits to engage. So people will say, Pastor Jack, I'd, we're not going to get involved. We just preach the gospel. Have you ever heard that? We're not going to speak out about what's happening in our community. We preach the gospel. Well, I've had enough of that. This is what we have found out that is being said. A pulpit that's not authentic, you'll find that it's a pulpit that does not engage the issues of the culture. But that pulpit knows enough to say, we preach the word of God. But do you really? Can you say that you've preached the full counsel of God? You want to go to a church that is engaging the issues with the word of God. This is important. This is not politics. But when the state of California stands up and says to the churches in California, we also have received the decision of the United States U.S. Supreme Court regarding the Hobby Lobby case and abortion, but I, as Governor Jerry Brown says, with our Attorney General, have reviewed the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, and we have found the U.S. Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. And so all churches in California will fund elective abortions. Only, only state in the nation that's been mandated by its governor to fund abortions. I just want you to know Calvary Chapel Chino Hills has not sent one dime. We surrendered our insurance. We don't have it anymore. We will not comply because God is the God of life. He's the God of the unborn. He loves the unborn, and God has called us to speak up for those and to rescue those who have no voice for themselves, those who are destined to death. You've got to engage the culture, because ladies and gentlemen, the culture is engaging you. A godless worldview system is coming after your children. Don't be fooled for one moment. This week, in our nation's capital, this issue had nothing to do with Judge Kavanaugh, had nothing to do with Dr. Ford. Don't fall for that baloney. Nothing to do with them. These are dark principalities and powers that are warring. There's a multi-billion dollar industry that is threatened by this next appointment. It has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with the Prince of Darkness. It's all about killing babies and murdering babies. And the, if the church doesn't speak up, listen, I believe that God has given the church a moment's time to speak up and let her voice be heard. And we've got such a short moment of time and the pulpits must be the tip of the spear and engage in the culture. The pulpit must engage and the church must follow the lead of their pastors. It's not politics. It's standing for righteousness. We preach the gospel, but after preaching it, what do we do? I'm all for preaching the gospel. I was speaking in San Diego just uh, last week to 500 uh, Hispanic-speaking, non-English-speaking pastors in San Diego County. They asked me to come and speak on a biblical worldview and how to vote Bible. And uh, one gentleman told me afterwards, he said, uh, you know, I just preached the Bible, Pastor. And I said, yeah, but what do you, after you preach the Bible, what do you, what do you encourage your people to do after they've got the Bible? 
What do they do for six days of the week after they've been preached to? The pulpits need to be engaging. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? The word actually means re-seasoned. You can't re-season salt. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. Matthew 5, before Jesus said that, how did he set that parable up, that statement up? Look at verse 10 in your Bibles, Matthew 5, 10. Jesus said to them and us, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is a given. We need to stand and speak the truth in love. Friends, many of you, just this week, last few days here in town, people have asked, you know, I have this situation at home, or I've got this situation with my husband or with my wife. And I, the answer is the same. Stay true to Jesus. Make sure that wayward child or spouse knows the gospel, but don't move, don't sway one way or the other. Stand firm, even though it might hurt and your feelings are screaming to do something else. Stand firm, tell them that you love them, but this is what the Bible says, because you will be the only anchor point for them to return to when they come back. You'll be the only one. If everybody else compromises in their life, they've got nowhere else to return to. Stand true and strong. Don't be afraid to engage. The time has come in America for the pulpits of America to lead the way, just like it did in our nation's history. I believe strongly that government cannot stop the church. We've got, our church alone has got several lawsuits against the state of California. We've sued the governor. We've sued the attorney general. Those are in court, and we're going to be going in the not-too-distant future to the U.S. Supreme Court, why all on biblical issues, on biblical issues that are under attack in California. Why are we doing this? To liberate the pulpits, to encourage the pulpits in America to stand up. Some pastors have told me, Pastor, I don't want to lose my 501c3. Do you know what I'm talking about, 501c3? Do you know what that is? This is my answer. You go tell your pastor this. If they're afraid of losing their 501c3, number one, if people are giving tithes to your church because of the 501c3 tax break? You know what that's called? Not worship. If you're giving money because you get a tax break, that's not worship. If a pastor won't preach it and teach it and engage the culture and be authentic because they're afraid of losing their tax credit by the federal government, I think my God is able to provide way better than the IRS. He doesn't need the government. There's not a government law that can be passed to shut up the people of God. Soviet Union tried, it failed. China, right now, the fastest growing Christian nation on earth. China. Not America. China. The fastest growing nation on earth with Christianity in the world. And every time they tried to make Jesus illegal, you know that great wall of China? Jesus just steps right over the wall. <laughs> they have media blackouts in North Korea. You know there are tens of thousands of Christians in North Korea. You can't stop God with government. He is the God of government. He's invented it, but it's been pirated. There's no law that's going to... Uh, trying to pass laws that you can't pray in public. You can't stop that. People are going to pray. What about the Bible? My good friend, the man who led me to the Lord on June 20th, 1977, Greg Laurie. He had a, he had a banner and he was holding up the Bible just before the Harvest Crusades. And he, he sent me a text. He said, did you see this? They're going to, uh, the Muslim community in Southern California is attacking the banners of me holding up the Bible. I said, use it. 
he, he, he texted me back. He said, the Bible? I said, no, use this opportunity. <laughs> they want to attack the Bible? Then you turn right around and you, you hold that Bible. In fact, Greg, next week's your crusade. Encourage all of your people to stand. 50,000 of them stand and hold up the Bible. And that will teach them to not criticize the Bible next time around. Just don't, don't run and hide. Don't go run and hide, church. You got to stand. You got to engage the culture. Listen, this man was commissioned by the French government. He was a political analyst, a historian. Many of you read him in college. Alexa de Tocqueville. He toured young America to get back a report to France as to why and for the explanation of America's rapid greatness. And he penned that in 1835. And this is what Alexa de Tocqueville wrote in his book, his report called Democracy in America. Listen to this. Quote, I sought for the greatness and genius of America and her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America and her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America and her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it wasn't there. I sought for the greatness and the genius of America in her Democrat Congress and her matchless Constitution. It wasn't there. It was not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I stand or understand the secret of the genius and power. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great, wrote Alexa de Tocqueville, the Frenchman. How will, I'm, I'm very grateful for what's happening in the United States right now. It just hasn't gotten to California yet, but I'm grateful for what's happening in America. But only God can make America great in the truest sense. We need revival in America. We need prayer. We need to cry out to God. We need to seek him. God will move. He's promised us. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. The Bible says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went out doing good, who went out doing good. Christians, we are to go out and do what? Good. That's called righteousness. Now that we're saved, we go out and do good. 1 Timothy 3.15. I write, Paul said to Timothy, so that you may know how, or how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Here it is, the pillar and ground of the Definite article, the truth. Can you imagine? Can you imagine us standing before Congress today or before any committee or before the Capitol and say, excuse me, everybody, but the Bible says the church is the pillar and the ground for the truth. Because I heard this week that people have, if you're listening to the testifying, people have their truth. Did you hear that? Did you catch it? It was said that this is the truth to them. Ladies and gentlemen, that is insanity. Mercedes Benz, they don't make cars that way. Boeing doesn't make airplanes that way. Can you imagine commissioning an electrical engineer at Boeing Aircraft and say, whatever is true to you, go ahead and wire up this airplane. I am not getting in that airplane. There's absolutes. No doubt about it. Number three, God's prophetic pulpit in the last days will have to be a prayerful pulpit. We have so much swagger and arrogance in pulpits today. It just seems to me if you're attending a church where it's all about the pastor, you need to pray. God will not share his glory with anybody. I don't understand. I tell you what, I'm grateful that my God keeps me on a short leash. It's terrifying. We were talking about it last night. It's terrifying to open up this book. The book of the ages, the eternal word of God, the Bible. Look, this leather-bound book does not contain the word of God. Do you understand that? Be careful. This doesn't contain the word of God. This is the Word of God. This is the Bible, God's Word. It's been attacked for 2,000 years. 
It's going to be attacked, and yet no one can find anything wrong with it. You might be a young person here today, and your college professor has mocked you by saying, oh, you know, the Bible's full of, full of errors and difficulties. You stand right up and you tell your professor, then why don't you document one of them and produce it? You'll be a billionaire. Well, my grandmother told me, well, your grandmother was wrong. Well, Dr. Phil said, we need to be prayerful because if we're prayerful, we'll be discerning. Again, somebody asked me, Pastor, at what point do I depart from my church? I said, have you prayed for your church? Have you gone to the leadership to speak to them about teaching the full counsel of God? Yes, I have. Then I said, all I can tell you is you pray and do what God tells you to do. But we need to pray. And I would say this. Remember, we read a moment ago that Jesus said, I've given you a little strength. I like that. When he told the church at Philadelphia, I've given you a little strength. You know what this means? Apparently, all you and I need is how much strength? A little, (laughs) right? Get a little bit of strength from Jesus, and you can go all the way to the end. And he went on to say that he'll open doors that nobody can shut and shut Doors nobody can open. And so when I think of a church that prays and a pulpit that is prayerful, this is personal. This this is what I share with you about what it means to me. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A prayerful pulpit, I think, should be described this way. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You got to do this by prayer that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How many churches are being swept away by the tactics of the devil today? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers in the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put it on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all, verse 16, he says, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts. You know, those are thoughts that are launched into your mind by Satan the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, this is what keeps it all together, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and being watchful to this end, that with all perseverance and supplication and for all saints, verse 19, I love this, Paul said, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. The pulpit needs to be a praying pulpit. Many of you know, if you watch us online, it's uncomfortable. Amir was just there last week. Um, every guest speaker we have mentions it to me. You say, Pastor, this, this plaque underneath the podium here is really uncomfortable. I keep, my foot keeps slipping off of it, and I stumble over it. And I said, well, we've worked hard to make sure it's that way. There's a plaque, there's a bronze, 35-pound bronze plaque that is there, known only to the speaker. And it says to them, it's long, but I'll basically say, you better, you better have prayed yourself ready, studied yourself up, and if that's true, then let yourself go. Just remember why you teach in this pulpit that beneath your feet are 24 old tattered Gideon Bibles that the Gideons gave us from all over the world to plant beneath the feet of the pastor and myself when we're teaching the Word of God, that right beneath us is the Word of God. And then there's a prayer shawl from Jerusalem, and we put stones from the Palm Sunday path. If you've been to Jerusalem, I had people on our tour pick up stones, and we put them in that prayer shawl and then we dropped them into the bottom of that hole on top of those Bibles because 
the stones, Jesus said, if you don't worship and cry out, the stones will cry out and worship. So those stones are a testimony against us. The Bible is beneath our feet, so we better watch out. But the prayer shawl represents prayer. None of it can happen without prayer. Number four, God's prophetic pulpit in the last days, it will have to be an expectant pulpit. A pulpit that is expectant. What do I mean by that? A pulpit that is based on the Bible. If it's going to be based on the Bible, it's going to be based on the blessed hope. Jesus Christ, my friends, is coming back. He could come back any moment now. If you understand your Bible correctly, you understand that he could come at any second for the church. Without warning, that's by design. Without any precursor. Listen, we all love watching J.D. and Amir and Billy and Eric and Jan and all. We love watching and listening. But how much of their reports are now more of an indication of the tribulation period events? Think of it. All this artificial intelligence stuff. The building of, a, of the temple. Global uh, government. All these things that are taking place. And there, it is exciting and we need to know it and we need to study it because the church ought to know. And it ought to help to keep you ready. But the bottom line is this. If we're seeing that stuff starting to form, then I ask you this. The Bible teaches clearly the rapture has no warnings. The rapture will take place before these events. Then how close are we? We're so close. We are so close. I'm surprised we're still here. That's how close we are. The pulpit should be excited. You say, wait a minute, pastor, you're confusing me. The pastor should be expectant of Christ's return, and that joy and excitement should motivate the ministry, and yes, and the decision-making of the ministry, yes. And what about the planning of the ministry? Yes. Well, pastor, how do you plan for the next 15 years? How do you raise up pastors for the next generation if you expect Jesus to come back any moment now? Listen, we're supposed to occupy till he comes. That's easy. I want to be interrupted. I want to be caught by Jesus when he comes doing the right thing. We want to shape the culture for Christ. Because Jesus could come back today. He may not come back for three years. He may not come back for 30 years. How many of you have grandkids? Raise your hands. Oh, yeah. Listen, that's why we fight. I mean, don't get me wrong. Our kids are great. But grandkids. I used to think grandkids were, I mean, grandparents were crazy. I used to think grandparents were absolutely crazy. And then I became a grandparent of three. And it's like, you know what? Not only is that God's gift, grandkids. But it caused me to roll up my sleeves and get back into the fight. Because if Jesus doesn't come back soon, they're going to inherit this knucklehead world of ours. And we need to teach them to stand and to be fearless and to be strong and to be engaging and to be prayerful. The pulpit needs to be expectant. Titus 2.13, one of my life verses, Paul said, looking for the blessed hope. The word means scanning, urgently, looking, awake, eyes wide open. For what? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an amazing statement. We're to be looking. We're to be watching. John chapter 14, verse 1. I love this verse. Man, listen, if you're not a pre-tribulationist, get your, get your scissors out and cut this verse right out of your Bible. Every post-tribulationist I know chokes right about here on this verse. They just, ah! John 14, verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, I go now, that means to the Father's house, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You've got to get raptured to get up to heaven, to this event, to this place that Jesus has prepared, and proof text is Revelation 19. The next time you see the church, she's in heaven. The door is opening up, and she's coming back with Christ on white horses at the end of the second coming or at the end of the tribulation period in the event of the second coming. The question is, how did the church get up there? Answer, John 14. Answer, 
1 Thessalonians 4. So get ready. The pulpit should be preaching the hope of this. Number five, and I go quickly. God's prophetic pulpit in the last days is to be fearless. The fear of man is killing the church. Friends, the fear of man. Pastors are coming out of seminary and they've been taught all these things about how to grow up a big church. Excuse me? Big. Since when has big become the target and the purpose for church? That's God's business. That is God's business. I quoted A.W. Tozer earlier. You know, he had a church of 150 people. On the other end of the pendulum, 19 years of age, Charles Spurgeon in London had a church of 10,000 people. That's up to God. But we've got pastors coming out of seminary and they're being schooled in social media more than they're being taught in eschatology. There's a handful of universities in America left, maybe not even a handful, that are staying true to the Word of God. All of this is causing pastors to get pastorate appointments, and they're fearful that they won't bring in the money. They're fearful that they won't bring in the numbers. They're fearful that they're not going to perform. All of these are carnal things. God will not bless that. The pulpit's got to be fearless. The pulpit and the Christian has got to be fearless in these days. Ladies and gentlemen, the church in America is already in the lion's den. And God is there with us, and he's waiting for us to stand up at our home. You may be an independent, a Republican, a Democrat. Personally, I'm a monarchist. Jesus is my king. But whatever you may be, whatever you may be, do you understand this? Above all things, you're a Christian first. Your citizenship's in heaven. And the pulpit needs to be a fire. The pulpit needs to be absolutely fearless. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's a promise. You know what? Maybe I should say Politics, ladies and gentlemen, in the church, and it's killing the church. It is my prayer that God would cause pastors to catch fire and that they would stand in the pulpits and the pulpit would begin to burn and those precious sheep would go out. You know, sheep are amazing. The relationship between sheep and a shepherd is awesome. Sheep imprint the pastor's teaching and heart into their lives and if it's done right it's it's productive because there'll be a fearless pulpit and a fearless church and then finally this I'm out of time it'd be a church that's and a pulpit that's faithful this is what listen all of us this is this is what you and I are going to be judged on in the end were we faithful were you faithful listen some of you back home we're going through through first Peter chapter 3 and there's many many women Peter's speaking to the many many Christian women who are married to uh, non-Christian men. What a hard thing. But that's your ministry. There are men married to unbelieving wives. That's your ministry. Be faithful. Whatever you do, be faithful at it. Christian, please, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you are involved in your church? You've got to be involved in your church. Be faithful. Be committed to something regarding the Lord Jesus Christ in ministry to his people that you must operate faithfulness. Faithfulness. You know those feelings, you know, where it's like, I don't want to go to church today, but I got to go because I got to unlock the door or I got to go because who's going to sing or who's going to, uh, do, you know, do the parking lot or the greeters. It's not uncommon for me to not want to go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> And Lisa will remind me, you're the one teaching today. You've got to go. 
I want to thank, though, all the faithful pastors that are in America. Good men holding down the fort. The Lord knows I am not complaining, but it's not an easy task. Thank God for the pastors that are holding the ground. Pray for them, fast. Lift them up, hold them close to you. And then finally, it's a prophetic pulpit. A prophetic pulpit this way. Matthew chapter 24, and I end with this. Matthew 24, verse 13. It's Resurrection Sunday. Now, behold, two of them were traveling on that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together regarding all these things that had happened. And so it was that while they were conversed and uh, reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went to them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? It's kind of funny, right? Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened here these days? And have you not known of the things or of the things that have happened in these days? Verse 19, look what Jesus said. What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, how the chief priest and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was the one who was going to be the redeemer of Israel. Indeed, besides all these, they went on to say, today it is the third day since these things have happened. So they're sad, they're bummed, no doubt. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they uh, did not see him. Verse 25, then Jesus said to them, and here it is for us, church, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Isn't that funny? Jesus believed in the Old Testament, all of it. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. A New Testament church is to do the exact same thing. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Jesus of Nazareth, we, Lord God, intercede on behalf of the house of God in America, in this world. Lord, in these last days, what time is left, may you ignite the church. May she arise and enter into the fullness of her glory that has been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. That she would stand firm, beautiful, strong, fearless, and faithful. And Lord, we pray that today you would move from one speaker after the next in all of your power. For Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, you are welcome in this place. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you, Jack. It's America's pastor. I need to make a few basic announcements. Please be, please be seated and let's not leave quite yet. Actually, I want to end my little announcements and I need my computer. Thank you, Eric. Um, I want to end my announcements with uh, sharing some things from my heart that um, I think are a little troubling. But before I do that, let me get to the mundane. Part of the mundane is, um, first of all, welcoming live streamers. Please bear with us, live streamers. Uh, there have been some glitches this morning, and I think we're getting them worked out. So some of it is your connection speed, which we can't do much about, but we're working on it. Okay, um, a few other things here. <laughs> we got 
men's bathrooms turned into ladies' bathrooms. How many conferences do you go to where you hear this? You've got men's bathrooms turned into ladies' bathrooms. They're downstairs, downstairs. In other words, not up here. So please be careful, okay? That's all I'm going to say. Do you get it? <laughs> be careful. <laughs> Ladies, if you want the men's bath, all right, all the way downstairs. So, and I hope we've caught the uh, issue in time here. We do have some lunches that are for sale, a couple hundred lunches, and then as soon as this gets up, I'm going to move into this a little more, uh, things a little more seriously. Um, and, uh, okay, thank you, Eric, whenever it is. Thank you. Um, Friendship Church Shakopee tomorrow. Amir Safadi is there, 9 a.m. and 10:45. That's not in my slides, so that's why I'm bringing that up. Control room. Can we get our our PowerPoint announcements up on the screens, please? Okay. Do we want? Do you want to move that? No, she has to use it there. There's no audio. You know, the Apostle Paul never used technology, and do you see why? I mean, <laughs> uh, Eric and I started in ministry when we, you know, back in the Stone Age, too, and we didn't have technology, so, and it sure was a lot simpler. You just load your car with a guitar and some things to sell and your ministry notes, and that's all you have to worry. You just have to worry about not getting lost without GPS. <laughs> okay, we're going to move ahead even without any uh, PowerPoint, because I've got my speakers on a tight schedule, so I've got to be on one as well. Um, you've all got a bulletin, and there's a, thank you, Eric, there's a, yep, a, a little order blank inside if you'd like to use that for CDs and DVDs for this year. And as you go out there, no, they're not ready yet. Lots of people say that. Will they go out to buy them? Or are they well, well, they haven't spoken yet, so no, they're not ready yet. So, 